Previously on Super Mario RPG Retrospective, The Legend of the Seven Stars. Nerporio goes through the final days of the 16-bit era and the effect the Super Mario series had on the developers at Squaresoft. They and Nintendo managed to collaborate to make an exclusive Mario RPG that was true to the Mario series, yet fresh and original at the same time. The unique style and gameplay for the Super Mario RPG was discussed in detail. Nerporio goes through half of the story with Mario and the help of his new friends Mallow and Gino, and even an alliance with his archenemy Koopa himself, he managed to rescue the princess from Booster the Manchild and return her to the Mushroom Kingdom. Princess Toadstool sneaks out of the castle so she can assist Mario in his journey to gather the remaining seven stars, help Mallow find his family, help Bowser retake his castle, help Gino put together the Star Road, and to put an end to the Smithy Gang's reign of terror on Super Mario's world. The link to part one is in the description. And now, the conclusion. Mario, Mallow, and their friends arrive at Tadpole Pond. Frogfucius updates Mario, telling him that a star was spotted on Star Hill in World 4, also known as Seaside with our heroes getting closer to their final destination. Star Hill is a very simple area, a very blue area with four sections. Mario needs to activate star flowers to open a large star door with a keyhole to proceed. As Mario is activating the flowers, he comes across several fallen stars with wishes embedded into them. There are two wishes I'd like to call out. One says, please let Mallow find his way home, triggering a scene with Mallow. Another is, I want to be a great plumber like my brother Mario. Apparently, Luigi exists in this world, but where is he? There are enemies crawling on Star Hill that include geckos, sackets, muku mukus, accompanied by mastodooms, and pulsars. We make our way to the fourth area to find the fourth purple star piece, unguarded for once. Mario makes his way to Seaside Town with similar ominous music to the previous towns that were being terrorized by Smithy's gang. The Mushroom Elder is acting very sketchy but insists nothing is wrong. He tasks us with retrieving the next star piece from the sunken ship along the sea coast. He just says he needs it without much explanation. But it makes me wonder, where are all the women and children? Surely there is more going on than we are led to believe. Mario makes his way to the caves adjacent to the sea and the sunken ship. You enter a room with a shaman shop set up to sell you weapons and armor. Mainly the hurley gloves for Bowser who can throw Mario into enemies as an attack, a Wump glove for Mallow, and upgraded sailor armor. The enemies here are Zeo stars and if you avoid them and get to the treasure chest with the power star in it, you can perhaps level up your characters depending on their experience level. Make use of the whirlpools to reach the bottom of the water to access the exit of the cave. Outside, use the whirlpools to access the bottom of the sea, avoid the squid-like bloopers, and jump and enter the sunken ship like a pipe. The sunken ship is a very haunting place, filled with creepers, dry bones, alley rats, usually accompanied in battle with reachers, straw heads, and gorgons. Be sure to be at least at level 12 to 15 at this point in the game. Make your way through the ship to come to a room that has six doors. Each door has a puzzle that gives you a hint on what the password is in the room with the letter boxes that leads to the treasure room. The games range from leading a paratroopa to knock a cannonball into a floating green switch to aligning trampolines in succession for a cannonball to hit a floating switch to a 3D maze to collecting moving coins 
to hitting cannonballs into the J blocks. If you haven't figured it out, the password is P E A R L S, Pearls, and the door opening leads to a boss fight with King Calamari, a giant blooper. You start taking out two rows of tentacles before reaching the head. Hit him with fire, but beware of his tentacle slaps and his status attacks. Defeat him to move deeper into the ship, avoiding cannons firing bullet bills, to encountering a mirror version of yourself in a room, to also encountering another treasure monster, Hedon, to obtain the safety badge. New enemies this deep include Bloopers, Mr. Kipper, Zeo Stars again, accompanying the battle with either Krusty or Luko. Keep an eye out for hidden rooms here as well. Make your way to the main office of Captain Johnny Jones and be ready to fight his shark men, Bandana Reds and himself accompanied by his Bandana Blue Bodyguards. Fight the pirate captain and his men until he challenges Mario to a one-on-one -on -one fight to see who is the bigger man. Mario wins and Johnny gives Mario the star piece as a symbol of his everlasting respect. Mario makes his way back up to Seaside Town with the Elder and his men waiting for him by the entrance. The Elder reveals himself to be another member of Smithy's gang, who goes by the name of Yuridovich. He demands you relinquish the star to him because Smithy himself has become concerned about Mario collecting the star pieces. If you don't, he will torture one of the town's residents by tickling them. In this game, if you do the virtuous thing, you usually get rewarded, so I simply handed over the star. Yuridovich flees to the coast, but their getaway blade vehicle is delayed. They are obstructed by Captain Johnny Jones and his men, but they decide to let Mario handle this. A boss fight ensues with Yuridovich revealing his true form, resembling a spear. His attacks include his spear, elemental attacks, and he eventually splits into two. Defeat him to retrieve the star. A key to the shed is left behind, so let's go free all the townspeople. The townspeople leave in a jiffy and the Elder expresses his gratitude by giving Mario a flower box, adding 5 to your total FP. The Elder tells Mario that there is a town of reformed monsters at the far end of Land's End that boasts about a star of theirs. Therefore, Mario and his friends make their way to World 5, Land's End. Land's End will get us closer to finding all the stars and closer to Bowser's Keep. We start out scaling the mountain path using cannons and yellow platforms, trying to avoid the Chows, a harder version of the blue canine from earlier, usually accompanied by the purple Octovaders. We need to get past the Gekets in battle who shoot out of cannons to occupy small platforms needed to reach the exit. The next area has two exits. If you want to continue toward the town the Elder mentioned, use the spinning flower to propel to the upper exit. If you want to head back to Kiro Sewers and get that out of reach treasure from much earlier, take the lower exit and jump into the cave. The cave leads you to Kiro Sewers. For now, Mario goes up, takes the upper exit and arrives at a donut block bridge. The Shaman makes a game of crossing the bridge in a certain time limit. I play it on hard so the cannon shoots bullet bills at you and if you fall, you lose. Cross it to get to the exit. Mario and his party are in the desert area that has many whirlpools. They need to enter the one that has the ant in it. When you make contact, you start a battle with Shogun. Keep doing this until you end up in an underground cave. Use two power stars to take out Gekets and Chows and make your way into Belome Temple. Belom Temple is the home of Belom, and looks like a golden version of Kiro Sewers. You will come across three Belom faces and you will need to hit them in different orders to receive different outcomes in the upcoming room, whether it be monsters, great items, and others, and a large door opening. You enter the next room, hit the lone Belom face, and determine whether the elevator will take you to his treasure room or Belom himself. We fight Belom again for a second time. He uses the same attacks. This time he will eat a character and clone them as allies for himself. Fun note, before I knew Toadstool's Japanese name was Peach, Belom, when he eats her, says she tastes peachy. 
Fight Bilom until he gets hungry and leaves the battle, allowing our heroes to make their way to the reformed monster town, Monstro Town. We get to Monstro Town and learn the star the seaside elder mentioned was actually a starfish that can sing and dance. The town leader, Monster Mama, tells Mario there is no star piece there, and the only direction to go is up. He will need to head to Bean Valley, but that will require scaling a really tall cliff. So Monster Mama summons the Sergeant Flutter of the Sky Troopas to assist Mario in ascending the cliff. Before Mario heads to the cliff, there are plenty of things to do, like Bowser reuniting with one of his Terrapin minions, Jagger, and we meet his martial arts master, Jinx and challenge them to battle many times. Bowser is not mad and is happy his former minion is happy and is training to come back to him stronger than ever. The inn is empty and you can go to sleep, but as you sleep, ghosts appear to you in a creepy way and initiate a game of capture the three flags around the world. The room in the center is sealed, so we will come back to that one much later. The cliff is located in an exit in the desert just before you enter the caves to Balom Temple. The Sky Troopas arrive in formation along the mound to assist Mario in reaching the top. Mario walks on each of the Troopas systematically before finally reaching the top with Sergeant Flutter timing you. Our heroes depart to Bean Valley and whatever is above. Bean Valley has the same music as Bandit's Way, filled with pipes covered with piranha plants called Chewies and Stingers flying around. As Mario navigates through this maze, he comes into an area with five different pipes, leading to underground chambers that have enemies, slot machines, and an entrance to the secret Great Guys Casino, but you need a membership to enter. Save the game and exit to the final pipe. A Shyaway appears and waters the piranha plant enabling another boss fight against Mega Smilax this time. He drops the seed and we learn the Shyaway works for someone named Valentina who is trying to keep people out of Nimbus Land. The next room we see is a traditional Super Mario brick and when we hit it, a beanstalk arises from it. We climb it and make our way through the clouds, climbing the beanstalk after beanstalk, fighting off heavy troopas and birdies. Mario makes his way all the way up to Nimbus Land. Mario and his friends arrive in Nimbus Land, and the people up here resemble Mallow. A woman named Valentina walks out of the castle and reveals that she has found the missing Prince Mallow and brings him out and is just a large dodo bird. Mallow is perplexed there is a prince that shares his name. They walk into the shop of sculptor Garrow and they notice that one of his works resembles Mallow. Garrow says that was actually King Nimbus as a child, but he looks at Mallow and reveals to us that Mallow is actually the missing Prince Mallow that Valentina claimed was someone else. Now, knowing Valentina's schemes, Garrow smuggles Mario in the castle as a golden statue. The bird posing as Mallow, Dodo, has to suffer Valentina's continued abuse and takes his anger out on the statues. Dodo likes to peck the statues, but Mario dodges it and we begin a minigame dodging Dodo's pecks. If he hits you, you will have to fight him. If you win, you earn a feather accessory. Make your way through the palace running into enemies such as Shaman, Slingshies, and many others. You make your way to a waiting room with a bunch of the Nimbus people and one of them gives you a key to a room with a giant egg. The room is guarded by a heavy troopa and we enter the room and start a battle with the egg. Keep hitting the egg until Birdo appears. You remember Birdo, the boss from Super Mario 2 who spits the eggs out, but is called Astro by mistake, a worthy note by yours truly. Defeat him to proceed to the throne room where Mario, Mel, and the others confront Valentina, Dodo, and the Shyaway. We give chase to them and end up in the back of the palace with Mario falling through a layer of clouds. Mario catches up with Valentina and Dodo outside the castle, and a boss fight ensues. The fight splits up with Dodo taking the middle party member to an isolated location to fight. Beat Dodo to return to the others. Be wary of status and elemental magic attacks from Valentina, and of course, watch out for Dodo's powerful pecking attack. Dodo and Valentina fly away in defeat, and Mallow is reunited with his mother and father the king and queen of Nimbusland, with a nice little emotional reign occurring. 
We meet the king and queen and they tell Mario that a nearby star piece has fallen into the barrel volcano and the only way in is to enter the royal hot springs. Our heroes enter the hot springs and jump off the clouds to fall inside the barrel volcano. The barrel volcano is another dangerous area with many monsters galore, including Magmas, Erlikons, Pyrospheres, and many others. You make your way through the level opening treasure boxes and collecting green frog coins until you reach Hinopio's shop, the Hinomart, consisting of an item shop, an inn, and an armor shop. Hinopio is also an avid collector of Star Fox Arwings. Mario proceeds further into the volcano and arrives to see a bunch of pyrospheres combined to form the Zard Dragon to ensue another boss fight. He's a tough boss that transforms into a zombie version after you do enough damage. Defeat him and go into the next room. A red star piece is there and Mario is about to obtain it. until it is whisked from him. We meet the Super Sentai inspired Axum Rangers who do a Team Rocket style greeting. They flee with Mario in hot pursuit, and Mario eventually catches up with them outside the volcano. Like Yuridovich, they are waiting for their getaway blade to arrive, but this time, we actually see it arrive and they jump on, with Mario jumping on after them, ensuing another boss fight. The Axum Rangers are a party of five, with pink and green providing magic attacks, and red, yellow, and black doing physical attacks. Dispatch pink first, then green, and then the rest, and the final part of this fight is attacking the breaker beam weapon that red operates. Breaker beam does a lot of damage, so stay healed up. Defeat them, and the blade will get destroyed. and the sixth star is retreat. Only place left is Bowser's Keep. Let's go back to King and Queen Nimbus to find out how we can get there. At Nimbus Palace, King Nimbus allows Prince Mallow and the party to use the royal bus to fly to the entrance of Bowser's Keep. What dangers lie in there after Smithy's gang has been perched there for quite a while now? Our heroes proceed to Bowser's Keep on the royal bus. Bowser's Keep is the same as before, but this time all of Bowser's followers are brainwashed and harder to fight than before. Terrapins are now terracottas, Goo Goombas inhabit the lava bridge, and the initial chandelier room along with the green Malakoopas. Unlike the first time, we go deeper into the castle into a dark corridor and it makes me think of the area right before fighting Bowser in Super Mario World. We come across Croco, who is there to sell you items and other necessities. The next room holds six doors, of which only four are required to be completed to proceed. Two doors are battle challenges where you do battle with many different monsters. Another two are action courses that require deep skill and action, most notably jumping and platforming and treasure collecting. 
The last two are puzzle-based courses requiring problem-solving of many forms from the player doing quizzes to games of intense caliber. Each door challenge ends with a reward whether it be an ultimate weapon for a party member or some rock candy that does 200 damage to all enemies. Once completed, you encounter a red Magic Koopa to enable another boss battle. Defeat him to restore Magic Koopa to his natural blue color and he will give you an everlasting coin treasure box that never runs out. Proceed deeper, evading twomps, and arrive at a similar chandelier room, but this time you fight Boomer, a samurai warrior who wields a katana. At red, he is weak to magic, whereas at blue, he is weak to physical attacks. Mario and his party defeat him and he ultimately commits seppuku while suffering an attack of sorts. The chandelier ho takes our heroes to the top of the castle where they confront the sword itself, Exor. You need to attack Exor himself, who is the pommel of the sword, but he can only be injured if you take out one of the eyes. Continue this to defeat him and he will suck you into the dimension which Smithy and his followers come from. We find ourselves in the typical final area of a square RPG, usually in a dimension between dimensions with floating platforms connected by studs and nuts reminiscing Mario 3 Doom Ship levels. You can fall off the platform, but you will land on a trampoline and will be sprung back up. Enemies include Glum Reapers, a clock boss consisting of countdown and dinglings that do decent damage and status ailments. Keep moving forward to come across an assembly line of machine-made gray versions of the smithy bosses you encountered earlier. I try to avoid them as best as I can, but you have to fight the Uridovich one. Defeat it to destroy the block and proceed down the pit. Mario and the party fight Cloaker and Domino who want to play. Defeat one of them for the other to retreat and join with a serpent machine as the one last ditch effort. Defeat them to enter the actual factory and dispatch the clerk, the manager, and the director. We get to the end of the facility and take on the factory chief and his gun yoke machine. The gun yoke can employ the breaker beam and many other deadly attacks, and the chief has some pretty deadly attacks too. Defeat them to access the final boss of the game. But before we take on Smithy himself, let us wrap up some loose ends. To enter that middle sealed door in Monstro Town, we will need the shiny stone. In order to obtain that, we need to go to Moleville and obtain it from a little girl in exchange for fireworks. We come back to and enter the sealed door to find ourselves in another dimension with a floating creature named Kulex wanting to take on this world's strongest warrior. We fight him and he is no pushover. Kulex and his four crystals that aid him in battle are high in HP and each have many attacks that do a lot of damage. Even with Princess's healer in your party, this is still a pretty tough fight and a red essence might be needed. We hear some familiar music from a fourth game in a certain fantasy series that may be final. Easily the hardest fight in the game and you defeat him to get the quartz charm and his gratitude for such an epic fight. Let's go back to the factory where Smithy is and save our world. We make our way back to the area we beat the factory chief in. Mario jumps on the switch to have the moving clock grab him and drop him in the pipe the weapons are coming from. We land to meet Smithy, who is creating more and more weapons while wearing the final star piece. He refuses to hand it over and the final battle begins. Smithy uses Sword Rain, Sledge as his main means to attack and we have to continue to hit him until he gets angry where the foundation crumbles.
Smithy and Mario's party fall into the underbelly of the factory, and Smithy transforms into his true final form. He can change the forms of his head, each with different abilities. The fight is pretty straightforward, but he can be deadly if you don't have healing items. Defeat Smithy to end this once and for all, with an epic blast to end all blasts. Mario retrieves the final star piece and sends it way up. with his mission complete bids them farewell and departs as he goes to rebuild the star road up above. Mario and his friends watch as the sword, Exor, fades away and the sun comes out. An epilogue ensues. Mallow is crowned prince and is the last time we see him sadly in any Mario game. Bowser and his Koopa Troop are repairing the castle with a shy guy goofing off and riding his clown car in the background. Will Bowser revert back to his old self and kidnap the princess again? Jonathan Jones, the shark captain, is staring off into the sunset, a true warrior. Krako tries to race Yoshi on Yoster Island but loses. Krako makes friends with Boshi. Todovsky is conducting an orchestra. Dodo is marrying Booster and Valentina in Marymore, but Booster is having cold feet and tries to flee the wedding, and I don't really blame him. Mario, Toad, Yoshi, Toadstool, and the Chancellor all say thank you for playing. We get a victory parade as the end credits, and that, my friends, is the end of the epic Super Mario RPG. I can tell you from the start that this game had a pretty massive learning curve for me as an 11 year old, but once I learned the system, it was a joy to play. 
I got so into this game that every time my folks would take me to Lion Video Rental on Saturday afternoons, I would itch and hope that the game would be in. Most of the time it was. I was initially perplexed at the idea that Mario would fight Bowser in the beginning of the game, and my mind was even more blown when Bowser became your ally later in the game, and I remember being excited telling my parents this, oblivious to their disinterest. This game retained the action platforming element, but introduced me to the JRPG battle system and inventory system that Square was known for, and created a new fan in myself to this very day. This game is great for beginners who want to get into the JRPG genre and was one of the earliest games ever to provide tutorials to help players learn the system and get the game underway. I love the 3D isometric style of the game, especially after coming off of playing the 2D pre-rendered Donkey Kong Country games with the third game on its way at this point. I love the epic story and the humor, especially the times where Mallow lacks self-awareness at points and Bowser is simply projecting when he acts all evil and menacing like in all the other Mario games. The idea that Mario is a celebrity in this game, especially the way he's received whenever he goes to a new town, in my opinion, translates from the Square team being huge fans of the Mario games themselves, with very strong opinions on what makes a Mario game a Mario game. Like I said earlier, my mind was totally blown when Bowser joins you against a greater enemy. And it meant something to me as a child, because bad relationships can get better over time. Having a greater threat always excites me. The music from Yoko Shimomura was fantastic and felt very at home in this game. I loved her take on Mario's pad with the combination of Super Mario 3 World 1 theme and the classic original Super Mario Bros. Overworld theme. I loved her take on some of the classic Koji Kondo themes, including the famous Super Mario Bros. Underworld theme, the Star theme, Bowser's theme from Super Mario 3, and the Super Mario World Over theme when Gaz is playing with his Mario and Geno dolls. I need a Geno doll. It was the very first time I heard any music from the Final Fantasy games, and I didn't even know it. I remember playing Halo at a friend's house, and my friend's brother was playing Final Fantasy 4, and I couldn't help but recognize it, and I was like, are you playing Super Mario RPG? And he looked at me and was like, uh, no. His Halo name was Cecil, by the way, so when I played Final Fantasy IV for the first time in college a few years later, I understood the reference. At release, the game sold pretty well, but it was also at the end of the Super Nintendo's life. And I feel it is a bittersweet feeling, because despite the positive reception of the game, there was never a follow-up to this, or the original characters that this game introduced. That happened because Nintendo and Square's relationship deteriorated as Square decided to develop for CD-ROMs instead of cartridges, so their IPs including Final Fantasy VII, Xenogears, and many others were moved to the PlayStation 1, which was launched in late 1995. A shame, really. Nintendo was following up the Super Nintendo with its own 64-bit cartridge-based system, the Nintendo 64, that would take 3D graphics and gameplay further. Super Mario RPG, despite not having a direct follow-up, had a great legacy and inspired two Mario RPG series, the Paper Mario series on home console and the Mario & Luigi games on handheld. Between the two series, I feel the Mario & Luigi series more closely resembles Super Mario RPG than its Paper Mario counterpart, because people from the original team went on to work on the Mario & Luigi games, including Yoko Shimomura, who provided the music, and directors Fujioka and Meikawa through their new company, Alpha Dream. After five games and two remakes, Alpha Dream unfortunately declared bankruptcy, so the future of the Mario & Luigi series at this time is called into question. In a recent interview with Fujioka by the MinMax channel, he has expressed interest in making a true sequel to Super Mario RPG as his final game, and as much as I doubt that would ever happen, I would leap for joy at the prospect. Super Mario RPG, to me, was one of those games that really rekindled my love for the Super Mario games that last to this very day, and one of those earlier games that made me as a kid. I loved the dialogue, the characters, the humor, the idea that Bowser becomes your ally, the bigger fish to fry villain from beyond Super Mario's world, and the beautiful 3D isometric art style. This game taught me the RPG concept and cemented my interest later with Square's other games that I played in college. 
I used to long to rent this every weekend, and my heart would sink if the game wasn't in. But when it was, I was very happy. I feel this is the best Mario RPG game, and gives the Mario series a nice new spin and creativity that refreshed my interest in one of the few games I would replay more than once. It just never gets old. I think the Square team did a very good job, and as Mario fans themselves working with the GOAT himself, Mr. Miyamoto, Super Mario RPG proves that fans can collaborate with creators to create something truly special. And I want to personally thank the team that put this together, and for Square and Nintendo being open-minded enough to work together to make this happen. Thank you again, and one day I would love to see Gino, Mallow, and all the original characters come back in some capacity and if it can be done, make a true sequel to Super Mario RPG. Square Enix, Nintendo, please consider Fujioka's request and make it happen and you will make me a happy nerd Corio. Other than that, if you are on the fence about RPGs or a Mario game being an RPG, I'd say give this game a shot. You will be in for a treat. A 7 star treat. Thank you for watching my Super Mario RPG retrospective. The Square team delivered a very great game, but at the same time, what were Nintendo themselves doing with Mario? Did they add an additional dimension to his being? Can Bowser abduct and hold the princess inside her own castle? Do multiple worlds exist within the castle? Will Princess Toadstool be going by a different name going forward? Does Mario have what it takes to master this added dimension and meet his goals in each level in a new open environment? Will players get used to Mario ha now having a voice? All these questions and more will be answered in the next Nerdporeal Gaming Retrospective, Super Mario 64. If you have made it this far, please consider hitting the subscribe button, the like button, and leave a comment so this video can be reached by other fellow fans. Will the new 64-bit era of Mario live up to Mario's previous games? Stay tuned to find out. So long, ye friends. Bye bye.